I can't remember. That's right. They, what they had, they they had the idea. One of their ideas is they want to make uh, public drunkenness uh, not a crime anymore. For example, yeah. and I go, well, I I look at that. Oh, here we are. Uh, abolish the offense. Um, abolish the offense of public drunkenness, and that's a petition they want signed. Hmm. So I go, well, hang on. So you want people to be drunk in public and not have them but i and i get and i can understand why they see this as a race-based issue because it just so happens that i guess from the stats more indigenous australians on on average are committing this offense as opposed to people who are white however that doesn't make it any less or more legal it just so happens to mean more people of a particular ethnicity are committing a crime that doesn't mean you need to throw the crime out Hmm. Yeah, it 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 what what I'm seeing is that this is very this is very poor argumentation, very poor uh it's a, it's not a good form of debate or discussion that we can be we, we can engage in in substance. That's the problem here. Well, yeah. And there's no uh you know, I'm just reflecting on all the episodes we've done. It's like, you know, ABC the, the news have a has a has a role in this then we have yep forgiveness what? we don't we haven't learned how to forgive each other and we uh, and then they also used to have social media has just inflamed us across the globe yeah well you saw mm. the uh, the uh the blackout post right all of the corporate companies just start posting on instagram and facebook and oh, twitter yeah. black the black things it's like what good does that do literally like you're paying lip service at that point yes yeah, token it, it's meaningless um. uh all right one one uh, one, inter- one interesting well just want to close it off one interesting point okay. of reflection because i think because i think we've warmed our voices at this point sure. one interesting point of reflection is that since the 19 since the civil rights movement we've been taught to i to um idealize uh, martin luther king jr and uh-huh. his and his speech his methods his approach which was primarily uh a pacifist approach a peaceful yeah. approach yet you look today at the tactics of the protesters and the rioters and all i see and the, and the rhetoric the language that's being put forward all i see is the tactics of malcolm x yeah uh so which, if i remember just because i was reading jonathan Haidt's book and yeah. i lent it off to the to one of my uh, co-workers mm. is that um yeah martin luther king had the what was more effective was we, let's have a common values kind of idea whereas yes. what happened now is we have a common enemy and the common yes. enemy will attract a lot of attention but is very violent yeah. and destructive yes that's right and um, that was mal and that malcolm x and martin luther king jr both members of the civil rights movement but polar opposites same side uh, different sides of the same coin in regards to their approach mm-hmm. and you look at that and you go well, hang on a second. Malcolm X was the one who was saying, "The white people are the devils. You need. We need to kill them. We need yeah. to. We need to. We need to fight in order to uh, to become equal." And we see, and I see the rhetoric that's being pumped out at the moment that's inflaming both sides, and people are now dividing back up into camps, not political camps anymore. It's just it's downright to skin color. It's like, oh, I'm the I'm in the white camp because I've got white skin. They're in the they're in the black and brown camp because they've got darker skin than me. Uh, and it's like that. It's such a ridiculous argument. Well, it really is. But the other thing is, all these uh, law enforcement and military people and taking me. Mm. Yes, and I I don't know I don't know what to think about it. Maybe maybe it's because maybe it's because they don't know what else to do. Yeah. Like they've run out of ideas of how do we get these people to stop acting like hooligans. Mm-hmm. But I see it also as a level of appeasement on their part, like possibly as appeasement of as an essentially capitul and capitulation. Yeah. So go go ahead, do what you want, riot, protest, burn burn your towns to the ground. We won't stop you. Which is the exact which isn't good either. Opposite of why you want them to uh, be there in the first place. Exactly. Anyway. We're back with another episode of The Fire in the Desert with myself, Johnny, and Pat. How are you going, Pat? Hey, Johnny. Pretty good. Thanks for having me back again. All right. Pope's Hill.
29th of May, 1915. Dear Mother, The cable of 9th sent with a batch of letters of 12th of April following me right into the trenches at a place called Quinn's Post. We have now been here under fire for almost three weeks. We were shelled while being landed in a torpedo boat. The landing beach is constantly being shelled and we have been bombed, sniped, etc. practically ever since. The first post this regiment held was Quinn's, when the trenches in some places are only 20 yards from the enemy, and funnily enough, the section I held was, and still is, connected by a communications trench with that of the enemy. The infantry whom we relieved bayoneted the Turks out of this trench and joined it with ours, then found it, it was untenable owing to machine gun enfilading it and had to abandon it, leaving it connected with ours, which rather adds to the interest of the position. One man declared he was a Greek surrendered at that point the first day I was on. We lost several men from bombs, cruel and nerve-wracking things, which are easily thrown by hand into our trenches. The enemy has the best of the deal geographically and numerically, but thanks to the heroic performance of our infantry before we got here, the moral superiority of our men is established and they embrace every opportunity to get at them the Turks with the bayonet. The Queensland battalions, 9th and 5th, have greatly distinguished themselves, but their casualty list will stagger Australia. The whole of the valley will hold is drenched with the best of Australia's blood, but the spirit of the men is splendid, especially the infantry, whose contempt for danger would, would do credit to the best regulars. We've had since rain, and as the position we held is a watercourse, the bivouacs in the gullies are even more uncomfortable than the trenches on the ridges under these conditions. So far, the saturated ground has not been responsible for much sickness, as if there are great positions in this direction. There was a nine-hour armistice last Monday to bury dead which were lying between the trenches and stinking us out. It is said 3,000 Turks and good number of ours were buried. Water for drinking is scarce. Washing forbidden? These small parties are sometimes allowed to go to, down to the beach at night as a great treat, and firewood practically non-existent. The ridges around our valley are something like one tree hill and covered with dwarf holly bush and no trees. Climate good. Outlook over the sea beautiful. Best love to all, GHB. So that was a letter from George Herbert Bourne speaking to his mother about his time in the trenches at Gallipoli. Uh, George was a major in command of B Squadron, 2nd Light Horse Regiment, as part of the Anzac Brigade that took part in the Dardanelles campaign in World War I, and he survived the war. Uh, so for Australians here, we celebrate the Anzac Day on an April 25th to commemorate. And what I want to do today is to understand how we got our tactics so wrong in World War I. So like episode 3, like the episode on MV Seawall, I want to rewind it back to some key people influenced the Gallipoli campaign. And, and that person is Sir Ian Hamilton, who's famous in Australian history. But I don't want to blame solely on him, I want to understand how the initial planning, the tactics and the operations are executed from the top down to the bottom because it led to this disastrous outcomes. So before I go through some of the points, uh, I guess Pat, what's your understanding of Gallipoli and Ian, Ian Hamilton? Well Johnny, with Gallipoli, it's a, I'd probably describe it as a key defining moment in Australia's both our cultural and military history and traditions. I, like many others, were taught about Gallipoli in school, like primary and middle school, all the way through, so I guess I'd say I'm fairly well familiar with what happened with Gallipoli. Less so Ian Hamilton. The name, name isn't really familiar, but I'd probably say it's best known as one of our greatest military defeats, uh, and one of our, actually one of our first major conflicts that Australia participated in while we were fighting under our own flag, as opposed to the British flag even though we worked alongside the British during that conflict. We remember it for our one of our greatest defeats at war. And I think that's something that's defined our cultural, historical, and military heritage. It's a constant reminder of the true cost of war, that it is not something to be glorified or seen as a good thing. We see it for a the tragic loss of life, but also the necessity for, in this case, fighting for our freedoms. Yeah, I think that is one of the things that galvanized Australia to to come together and to solidify ourselves as a nation from suffering because 
so many people on that day of you know Anzac Day, April twenty fifth, died, mm. and because there were people from all over Australia, you know, you could expect every town would have x many families with notices saying that the son was killed or the husband was killed or the brother was Absolutely. killed and that sort of forged the nation together so yeah have you, have you watched a filmed version of about gallipoli called uh well it's called called gallipoli the title of it's by uh, peter weir the director uh, that's the the, the Mel gibson one right that's right yeah. I've, yeah I've got no idea how i guess if there's any historical inaccuracies but i do remember that movie watching it while it was a school project and that left an impact in regards to seeing the the really individual nature the idea of this potentially australian country town this uh this young kid who's grown grown up there and he goes to war believing it's going on a grand adventure and yeah. what he finds is the true horrors of trench warfare yeah i think you know the tragedy is we're doing uh, what we see in World War One is seeing it in the tactical level of Gallipoli, which is Absolutely. trench warfare, uh, frontal assault against machine guns. Uh, mm -hmm. We would use bayonets. We would use preparatory bar bombardment to smash the positions and assume time and time and again that the positions have been destroyed, only to find that they're all ready for us when we get up from the trenches. And we, we haven't overcome that learning loop to actually realize that, hey, we're probably not, this frontal assault thing is probably not working. All right. So, all right, we'll move on to section two, which is the purpose of Gallipoli campaign. And I guess what a, for people who are not Australia, you know, this was located in Turkey. So Gallipoli was along the Dardanelles area, which led into the, the Black Sea, which was where the Russians were so located on. So Russia... France and the UK were all on the Allies' side, and they wanted to support Russia and open up a second front. So Winston Churchill was the first Lord of the Admiralty, and he wanted to get the Navy involved in World War I. So the Western Front had already occurred, and this was his big campaign proposal. So to open up a second front to World War I, away from the Western Front, to outflank the Axis, which was Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. And it would open up a logistical route to Russia through the Dardanelles Straits. And it will be a quick knockout of Turkey from the war, um, which was also known as the sick man of Europe. And the idea was that the Ottoman Empire was this great empire, but it had suffered from decay, from rebellions, from, you know, um, a stagnation. They weren't as strong or they weren't perceived as strong uh, compared to the rest of the European empires and thought that they were just going to crumble from within mm. uh, the consequences of Gallipoli campaign so the allies casualties was about 302,000 with 46,000 killed the Turkish casualties were 250,000 casualties with 56,643 killed uh, Sir Ian Hamilton was the commander of Mediterranean expeditionary forces leading the Gallipoli campaign, he was recalled to the UK. And then he, uh, his military uh, campaign was, in, sorry, his mili military career was, had ended. Winston Churchill was then demoted. And then the UK Prime Minister H.H. H. Asquith resigns. Uh, the new Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, takes over, implements a war council that is directly controlled through London. So then we have this shift. So gone are the days where generals have freedom on the battlefield to do what they want because now there's so many casualties that it affects the people back at the home front. Mm. Politicians are asking questions about this and then they're asking stuff about the operations and the campaigns, which I guess it has its plus and minuses. So there's some kind of you know accountability to the politicians. But then if you had to do everything, if you had to present all your plans to the UK, to your government, to your politicians... You know, are they the right person to understand the risk of, of this area? Do they know this, the expertise of tactics? Have they gone through, you know, war? Did it, or they think it's you know it's like a sterile thing where we have to get no no casualties kind of thing? Um, yeah, so that's the re response to a public outcry of mass casualties. Mm. You can't just keep throwing lives away as solution. And uh, I guess when we. I'd probably say that's a that's a good thing because as with anyone with powers, you want to make sure that that power has checks and balances. 
Mm-hmm. Now, you, I think you raise a good point. Are politicians the best well-equipped to authorise or make military decisions? I think there's a bit of give and take, is that you want to make sure you have a general who isn't going to carelessly or needlessly throw the lives of their soldiers away. You want to have good generals in place who know the risks of, of war and can provide you with solid advice that you that the politicians can then act on and make informed decisions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Uh, you can't just use people as cannon fodder against exactly. you know, artillery yeah. and machine guns. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and we talked about it, like the, the galvanizing Australian attitude, because uh, we had the Anzac Brigade landing in Gallipoli and taking a brunt of casualties. It became a national day, and it sort of separated the UK and Australia. They had their own identity because almost every town was affected by a loss of family member. Mm. Mm. Uh, and then Sir Ian Hamilton. So, so he was a British general. He served in the Second Anglo-Afghan War, the First and Second Boer War, the Mardis War um, the, in Pakistan. He almost won two VCs of Victorian crosses. So, uh, he, you know, he was no doubt brave. He was an observant in the Russian-Japanese War in 1904, which ten years later approached World War One, and many observers who were in the Russian-Japanese war, found themselves into high positions later on in World War I. They became, you know, generals, they became staff officers, which led to planning. And for myself, I was doing some preparatory work. I was reading a staff officer's scrapbook during the Russian-Japanese war by Sir Ian Hamilton and volume one of his Gallipoli diaries to have a look at what was his observations, his learning points from these two experiences and whether we can draw a connection there so johnny you think that what sir ian hamilton saw or observed during the russian japanese war directly influenced his tactics his military shall we say decision making when the time came for him to when the time came for him to land in gallipoli and he was put in charge of winning that particular front i, w- I would say it affected some of the early decision making and this is probably some of the other stuff that you would see in uh, those experts who come from the Russian-Japanese war mm. and try to look at World War One, And they took probably the wrong lessons okay. and they applied it to World War One. Well, let's dig into the Russian-Japanese war then and figure out a bit more of what, uh, what so Ian Hamilton saw. Yeah, well, well I, I sent you a video earlier on. Yes, I, did. I had a look at that. It was, you know, like sort of the cheesy sort of, you know, visual effects, but I think it might have hit a few points there. So what's your, what was your, I guess, observations and feelings when you saw those videos of the Russian-Japanese war? I'm not, I'm not sure. I, from the video, it was, a, it admittedly was a little hard to follow. It looked like it was following, well, in this case, it was following the Japanese side of the conflict. Their tactics they were trying to use were just completely inefficient in any meaningful sense against trying to take ground from the enemy mm-hmm. it, it just they were being mowed down at every step along the way massive massive loss of life yeah, yeah. like so, so climbing up the hill like, yeah <laughs> running up the hill and then uh, engaging in this futile it looked like, it looked like a, going through an urban urban uh, street by street conflict and just getting yeah. mowed down because of the uh, small spaces in the in the terrain did you notice the uniform? On actually, that was that was one question I had because initially I was trying to figure out. Okay, look at the uniforms. Tell that'll tell me who the different sides are. I think the only difference I saw was the color, the red and yellow. Yeah, but I might have missed something. I'm not sure. So, so you had that sort of dark blue, sort of I guess Russian Napoleonic kind of style. Right. Like they had the the caps. They had bright polished boots, bright uniforms, sashes. They had their rifles out. They had bayonets stuck to uh, on, attached to it, ready yeah. to go. And you know, you, you think later on, it's that this is sort of modern conflict. This is not the the Revolutionary War or the, or the Napole- Napoleonic War, mm. where you sort of you know march in that film foundation. You see, like the Patriot, where they all line up and they yes. go present, make yeah. ready, and they make, present weapons. <laughs> and uh, watching movies like the Patriot and other movie movies that are of that colonial esque era, it's it's such you look at it and go that is such a bizarre way 
to conduct warfare, but that was what was normal. You had the rank and file, and it was dignified, it was orderly, and there was like there was a properness to the to conflict. There was a, a cleanliness and, and a. I guess it has that romanticism and gentlemanly kind of. But like you know, wearing bright red on a battlefield, you think about it nowadays, it's just a big target. Like, and you're what, like, what, what in the world are you doing, man? Take, <laughs> yeah. Put that, put, put, put on army fatigues for goodness sakes. Yeah, and then you have like these machine guns, and it, and what you saw on the Russian side was, they were just like bunkers, f- concrete bunkers with maximum, you know, World War One style machine guns, and just yeah. mowing all these guys down in yeah. their bright polished uniforms. And, and I think mm. that's that's a tragedy in 1904. <sighs> It was at the turn of the 20th century that warfare f- was fundamentally altered, where humans started figuring out, hey, we can make weapons that cause mass human casualties now, such as the machine gun, and the tactics mm-hmm. then started to change as well. Trench warfare became a common military tactic, and yep. you can't... I-, I, remember reading, I remember reading about the Australian, or the Australian light horse the, and the British light horse, where... The commander, after a conflict, uh, I think it was during World War One. after a conflict, he was reflecting, going, I used all the right tactics. I lined my men up on their horses, and we charged off into the battlefield, and they were supposed to engage the enemy, but the machine guns just mowed them down. And he was remarking yeah. in this, almost this shock of, why didn't my tactic work? It's straight out of the textbook. This is how it was supposed to go. But I thought that that was supposed to work. On the Russian-Japanese War from, which was 8th of Feb, 1904, to 5th of September, 1905. So about one and a half years of conflict. So the battleground was in China. So you had the Qing Dynasty from 1636 to 1912. It was a state of internal decay. There was rebellions. There was a loss of technological, economic, and military edge to the Europeans. You had the European colonial powers taking territory and making un- pretty much unfair deals with China. So there, it was China was probably known as the sick man of the East. So like Turkey, it was it had that sort of internal decay. The actual battleground was Manchuria. It was this area located just past North Korea, uh, which bordered with Russia, and it was this rich industrial area with coal, fertile soil, and raw materials. So it's a it's a great spot for other powers look at and say, hey, I'll, I'll take some of that. So let's look at the belligerents. So Russia, uh, it, it had lost some battles on the European side. There was the Crimea War, uh, which had a loss. Uh, there was a, a loss of trading power. And Russia, I guess, is occupies the north of the globe. It has a lot of cold areas. And so one of the things you want to do in trade was you have want to have ports and because all the ports are in in russia are frozen then it sort of restricts trade so they're looking at this area south of um south of russia looking at china say hey we want these warm water ports that can offer us trade throughout the seasons and that was looking at port arthur in china the other side so the other side was imperial japan from 1868 to 1947 which which had gone from rapid industrialization and was starting to become more of an empire so when a population increases uh, how what do you do to sustain the, the economy of such a, a growing power you need more resources you need land to settle your people so to grow your population and to grow the economy and they established korea as a part of its sphere of influence it came about with russia leasing part of port arthur for 99 years and japan looking a bit concerned and saying hmm we don't want you guys so close to our border of korea and and that's when japan did a preemptive strike before declaring a war they attacked the russian navy established a blockade and minefield and landed its forces immediately on the north uh, onto the Korean Peninsula without much, much confrontation, and conducted a land battle against Russia. Can I? Yeah. Can sorry? I? Can I just add that for some reason Japan and preemptive strikes just sound like they, as a matter of, hist- of history, they don't seem to end very well for Japan. Might I just mention? <laughs> well, well, that's what you got from World War Two, right? With um, <laughs> Pearl Harbor. What is it? Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Yes. Well, they they learned from 
uh, they probably learned from Pearl Harbor and so they probably learned from the Russian Japanese war and go, hmm, it worked against the Russians, so maybe we'll, we'll go ahead. But I believe the preemptive strike bit was uh, before declaring declaring war was there's some communications uh, fairly between Japan and their delegate. Um, communications weren't as you know quick mm. back then compared to World, World War Two. So Japan forces across the border of Korea and China to into the Yalu River, and they fight down into Port Arthur. Then with the surrender of Port Arthur, they turn north to to fight the Russians arriving from the Trans-Siberian Railway. If you looked at, if you didn't know about Russia and Japan, the outcome of the war, but you look at the geography, the size of the population, their experience in battle and history, like who would you think would win? Who would I think? So if I didn't, if I didn't know historical if, context, so, yeah, you know, if we didn't live past sure. 1905. If you had to put your bets, mm. you look at Russia, this huge country on the globe, experience with a battle-hardened army from the Crimean War. They've had this long history. You know, they fought against uh, was it the, the Mongols? They fought against the Ottoman Empire. Fought against Napoleon. Had, I'm pretty sure Napoleon. Fought, from yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They fought against honestly, Napoleon. I'd I'd probably pick the Russians because you're fighting even even with the the bone the benefit of a preemptive strike and catching them unawares. You're right. They they are battle hardened. They know what they're doing there, and they're in their home turf as well. Fighting mm. in the frigid frigid cold wasteland that is Russia is not mm-hmm. something I would hasten to rush into. Well, the French and the Germans uh, sort of. <laughs> yeah, <did laughs> yes, they? exactly. Well, hey, we can thank the Germans for one thing. That um, they mm. tried to attack in Russia in the middle of winter. That's how we. That's basically how we won World War Two. All right. Anyway. I digress. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was a great shock because the outcome was Japan won. Mm. I mean, you look at the landmass, the material, experience on both sides, and also a little bit of prejudice from the European powers looking at Japan because, you know, what was happening on the east with the relationship to the west? Mm. Well, you know, China was this had territory taken away from them on the colonial power. So, you know, this sort of oriental people, uh, maybe they're not so great compared to us Europeans. And what you saw during the campaign in Russian Japanese War was the evolution of tactics when I mean, it started to look like the early mid World War One. So they did the whole lose many men towards a mass human wave attacks against a well entrenched enemy. They started doing offensive trenching. So, you know, trenches will be used as defensive positions. And now they sort of tr- dig a little bit closer and closer towards the enemy's trench. And then they would direct artillery communications. Uh, they would do their launch point to do their to, to attack the enemy. Uh, there was use of siege artillery, so we're looking at huge shells which would destroy reinforced structures. There was starting to become evolution of tactics of you know concentration of firepower, orchestrating the artillery with the inf- infantry. Uh, so you see like use of flags. So when they capture a flag, that means the artillery can shift to a different position and, and bombard the, the, the next trench so they can take so they can the infantry can ready and move under cover. Uh, there was the use of offensive machine guns to suppress the enemy trenches while the infantry attacks. There was the use of grenades and mortars, and cavalry wasn't used as much. So they haven't developed shock action kind of tactics with you know cavalry charging to mass masses of men sort of didn't work against machine guns and in well entrenched positions and so cavalry was using sort of dismounted rifle attacks uh and, you know because shock action what would look, come out of the world war one would be the tank so there's a few key battles that would preempt world war one during this russian japanese war so the first one we're looking at is the Battle of Nanshan, which was 24th to 26th of May, 1904. So I've got a few maps in front of us, and we'll, we'll try to describe it for our listeners there. So where's Nanshan? So if you look up the Russian-Japanese War and you try to look at Port Arthur, what happens is that you look at Korea, and you cross the border of Korea, and you turn west southwest and head towards port arthur port arthur sort of sticks out in this yellow sea area um bit of bit of a penin- bit of a peninsula almost yeah so it's called a laotong peninsula mm. 
And if you can look at the, the gray map uh, I've got, it says Liaotong Peninsula, you have this little bottleneck of an area mm. from the mainland and then Port Arthur is sort of this island that sort of butts out. So the bottleneck is Nanshan. And so what the Japanese would have to do is they have to cross this bottleneck and then move in, move past the bottleneck and surround Port Arthur and lay siege to it. Mm. So we can actually get a few photos of battle maps and positions of the Russian during the Japanese war. So what we have in front of us is we have the Japanese map and you can see the, the bottleneck it's, and the bottleneck is like, there's two sort of bodies of water. Um, and you have this hill called Nanshan and the, the Russians have put a, a fort on top of it. And if they put 35,000, on the Japanese side, they had three divisions of armies. Like second army, first, third, and fourth division, roughly about 35,500 men. Russia only had 3,000 men in this well-entrenched position on Nanshan, so 3,000 men of the 5th East Siberian Rifles. And what, what is the outcome of that battle? They had 6,000 casualties for the Japanese, and 1,500 casualties for Russians. So the Russian side has inflicted so much more casualties on the Japanese side. Mm. There's a disproportionate amount of casualties inflicted on them. Which usually indicates that the side that loses the most, most soldiers, usually that means that they've lost, usually. Yeah. Mm. But if the Russians could only hold on a bit more and probably reinforce the area, they could have stop the the Japanese army from crossing the bottleneck and then laying siege to to Port Arthur. Yeah. The lessons are there. A well-entrenched enemy in forts and machine guns can hold back the enemy 10 times its size. So the Russian side, they had there was confusion between orders to delay versus hold the enemy back. So that was more of a leadership position. The generals sort of giving orders to these, to the 5th East Siberian Rifles. So they only retired when the Japanese managed to outflank them. They had five layers of trenches with landmines, five kilometers of barbed wire, two searchlights, and 10 machine guns defending the position. And the Russians, well, they lost a lot of artillery pieces because of poor positioning and camouflage. So what they were doing was that they were putting the artillery pieces, you can see the cannons just on top of the hill. So in the front side of the hill, rather than the blind on, on the reverse slope. So you could, you could see it from far away. And what the Japanese would do is like, well, that's the artillery, we'll smash the artillery and then we can at least launch our attack because the artillery would lay waste to all the, the soldiers advancing the open. So there was a lack of Russian artillery support and there was not enough reinforcements to the 5th East Siberian Rifles. And for the Japanese, what they were doing with the artillery was they were using camouflage, they were con concealing their, their, their pieces and then at the last safe moment, they would shoot at the artillery and destroy it and then therefore that will be the enemy artillery neutralized. So there's, we used to see in the in Napoleonic era was that they would have artillery duels between two pieces out in the open and they will position themselves without any camouflage. The Russians did that in this war, in the Russian-Japanese war and lost their pieces and the Japanese managed to conserve their forces there. So eventually the Japanese managed to outflank the 5th East Siberian rifles and what they do, they actually cross one division into the ocean just to outflank them from the rear. But by that time, you, you've noticed the casualties, Japanese casualties are so high that they, they took the position and the Russians withdrew. But what you want to do is that you want to seize the initiative. You want to chase the, the enemy away from you and to um, destroy as many forces while they're in that sort of retreat. But because they were so, the Japanese were so exhausted, they had to consolidate and it gave them time for the Russians to move without being harried and dig in deep into the other position with, with their men. And this would become sort of the pattern in the Russian-Japanese war. So while the Japanese would win the tactical victory, they would throw all the reserves into the attack to make it succeed. And, and that's the thing, because your reserves are mostly for countering any unforeseen enemy action rather than support the main effort. If they're supporting the main effort, they're just, you know, another layer in depth to 
they're, they're pretty much part of the main plan rather than your emergency contingency, right? Yeah, so, so yeah. That's, that's the thing. So the Japanese won, but they were exhausted every time they won a tactical victory. And that trick only works so many times as well. Yeah, we, we think the Japanese won in that battle. It was like, and they won the war, but they could not take advantage of their victory because their forces were so depleted, so exhausted that they couldn't pursue the enemy and to get a complete victory. Partial victory. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, so just to read out from a memoir there, so it goes, After this battle, we captured some damaged machine guns. This was the firearm most dreaded by us. A large iron plate serves the purpose of a shield, although which aim is taken, and the trigger can be pulled while the gun is moving upward, downward, to the left, or to the right. More than 600 bullets are pushed out automatically in one minute, as if a long, continuous rod of balls were being thrown out of the gun. It can also be made to sprinkle with shots as roads are watered with a hose. It can cover a larger or smaller space, or fire to a greater or less distance as the gunner wills. Therefore, if one becomes a target of this terrible engine of destruction, three or four shots may go through the same place in rapid succession, making the wound very large. The bullets are of the same size as those used in a rifle. A large number of these shots are inserted in a long canvas belt, and this belt is loaded into the chamber of the gun. It works like the film in a vitoscope, and the sound it makes. Heard close by, it is a rapid succession of tap, tap, tap. But from a distance, it sounds like a power loom heard late at night when everyone else is hushed. It is a sickening, horrible sound. The Russians regarded this machine gun as their best friend, and certainly it did very much as a means of defense. They were wonderfully clever in the use of this machine. They would wait till our men come very near them, four or five ken only, and just at the moment when we proposed to shout a triumphant banzai, this dreadful machine would begin to sweep over us as if the besom of destruction. The result being hills and mounds of dead. After this battle of Taipao Shan, we discovered in the enemy position of the body of one soldier called Hyodo, who had been one of the forlorn hope scouts of the second company. He had no less than 47 shots in his body, 25 on his right arm only. Another soldier of a neighboring regiment received more than 70 shots. These instances prove how destructive is the machine gun. Of course, the surgeons could not locate so many wounds in one body and invented a new name, whole body honeycombed with gun wounds. Whenever our enemy attacked the enemy's position, Invariably, this machine gun that, would, that made us suffer and damage us most severely. And that was from the, a passage from the book called Human Bullets by Tadayoshi Sakurai, uh, which sections the accounts of the battle after, after the battle of Nanshan, and he was a lieutenant who served in the Russian-Japanese war. Yeah. You stop and just imagine the emotional, and psychological toll that when we think of machine guns today, we've kind of got a picture in our head of a gun that fires bullets rapidly, but that sort of weapon didn't exist at that point soldiers or people encountering this on the battlefield and going what what is this because it, it almost defies comprehension or description for someone back then when you go you've got a gun that can do that amount of damage to the human body hmm. it's you know if you think you're going to napoleon like you know warfare with muskets and rifles and we all aim at one point mm. we march slowly towards the enemy and you have this machine which you tick, 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 and just knock down yeah. everyone like bowling pins it's like mm. you got to change your tactics there's watch yeah. watch a clip of the, from the movie patriot of the the right the lines of riflemen or of musketmen essentially that would march all in time and line up and they would cleanly take their time to line up the enemy shoot pause reload while the enemy while the enemy does the same thing in reverse and that was warfare back then you trans you fast forward and you're right you go to this new conflict and we're bringing new technology new new ways of conducting warfare it's completely completely alien it's it's insane
horrible casualties experienced on the Japanese side indicate that the old tactics of the Napoleonic era were outdated against a new industrial age weapon of the machine gun. Machine guns could fire more rounds at a human body faster than a soldier could shoot. When you experience these large casualties disproportionately on one side in a matter of a few days, it will be a wake-up call to show that your tactics and procedures aren't effective. And so the Japanese forces would then evolve their tactics, but at a bloody price against a well-prepared enemy. These are the battles, the tragedies of human loss, that would soon be experienced by the empires in World War I. However, we've heard about the European and American observers embedded on the Russian and Japanese sides, and their aim is to learn the hard lessons and bring them home so their sides could have the military edge in fighting. Well, let's see what happens. You know what? You think that you would learn after having 6,000 casualties, mm. right? Well, not really. Let's move on to, I guess, August 1904 to January 1905, which is the Siege of Port Arthur. So they managed to break through Nanshan and surround Port Arthur, and but the, the Russians are ready. They had their entrenched concrete bunkers on the, on the hills with machine guns. Mm. And let's see what they have. So Japan this time had 150,000 troops versus Russia 50,000 troops. So they outnumbered them three to one. But the casualties of this battle, 57,780 Japanese versus Russian 31,306. So the Russians killed more than what they had on their, own, on their own side. So they managed to at least defeat the same number as what they did against an enemy three times its size. Yeah. And again, the same tactics are applied by the Russians. So defense in depth, layers and layers of fortified entrenched hills, concrete forts, mines, barbed wire, electric wire as well. Uh, they had... So artillery here had started to develop, so now it's rapid fire artillery, so they can shoot more than one shell in a minute. Smokeless powder, so you can really you can always see where they're coming from and locate them. And these are machine guns. And here's an interesting thing. So grenades and trench mortars, they weren't really used by the Japanese. They were sort of improvised by then, but the Russians were they had grenades and they would just roll them down the hill into the enemy trench. To, which, and or, or just thrown down, so it's easier for the Russians to defend their positions. Or the Japanese, they had to didn't have any of these things ready. So you would you would hear accounts of bamboo mortars <laughs> that that would that would like you know these fixed sort of tubes that would shoot towards the enemy and clear out the trenches. And then look at uh, two particular battles. So the outer perimeters of Port Arthur, so Hill 174. The battle occurred on 19th to, 19th to 22nd of August and Hill 203, 20th September to 5th of December. So I think when I show you that video, that was 203. So Hill 174, so it was the first general assault from the 7th to the 24th of August and they did you want know, a frontal assault at the concrete forts. Uh, casualties 14,000 to 15,000 for Japanese and Russians had 3,000. And by then, the Japanese Third Army had lost one third of its strength. And they said, Well, you know what? These general assaults didn't work. So they start doing siege, uh, siege warfare. So they start digging in. They had the trenches dig closer and closer to the enemy trench so they can direct the enemy, uh, so they can put in communications, uh, put in telephone wires, and also direct accurate artillery fire onto any positions and then for hill 203 you had it occurred from the 20th to 21st of september and who were there the veterans from nanshan so 1500 russians all experienced ready to go and there was a J japanese general attack which crossed 500 meters in the open ground and obviously it was stopped stopped by combination of artillery machine guns and grenades so after two days, Japan had lost about 2,300 casualties and Russia had only four, 400. Sorry, I'll read a bit from, from my account from that time. So, although the Japanese had more than one good lesson from us, they were not satisfied. And here and there came out of the trenches in considerable numbers, were immediately driven back again by rifle machine gun fire from the 203 meter hill and Akasa Yama. However, with demonical persistence, they twice crawled through our wire entanglements 
and on the left flank even gone as far as the breastwork. But decimated by hand grenades, they broke and fled, strewing their slope to the hill with the dead. So that was a book by Alexandrovich Treyekov, who was a, I believe he was a lieutenant colonel serving with the 5th East Siberian Rifles. So uh, it's called My Experience at Nanshan and Port Arthur with the 5th East Siberian Rifles. The Japanese got halted in attacks. Again, they had to switch to sort of siege artillery, a siege uh, siege warfare mode, and that's what, that was the only way they could. So the Russians had developed these bunkers, which were good against six-inch artillery, and the Japanese had to bring out their eleven-inch siege artillery cannons so they can destroy these uh, positions. And they actually aimed to the rear, where the Russians were assembling the, in the reinforcements. After combining eight Japanese battalions, about two thousand four hundred men, they can take take the position of two zero three which looked over into the harbour of Port Arthur, and they can start taking out the Russian fleet. But what was the cost? So it was 10,000 Japanese versus 5,000 Russians. And that's the thing, like, if you are taking massive amounts of casualties, that means you are learning lessons in blood. Mm. You haven't learned your first lesson, you're doing everything from the scratch. Like, you're doing these general assaults and general t- frontal attacks, against these well-entrenched positions and it's only after you've taken a few hits and you go you know it's not working we've got to switch to different tactics <laughs> i think that's the hard lesson that's being learned here from russian japanese war what has it got to do with ian hamilton well he arrived on the 6th of the march from 1904 until the 1905 but his book only goes up to july 1904 so it doesn't cover these two battles unfortunately when I was reading it, there was a lack of analysis of the infantry tactics. So it was sort of like this maneuver sort of warfare with troops out in the open, sort of Napoleonic style. It does mention trenches and artillery tactics. So, you know, we're talking about cannons, Japanese artillery able to smash the Russian artillery because the Russian artillery wasn't camouflaged or entrenched. But they do lack details about machine guns, grenades and mortars. And I guess why is that? Because machine guns probably weren't fielded in such large numbers until the winter of 1904 to 1905. And what was another thing? Well, he has a lot of the battle plans from the Japanese staff, but he actually records in his diary that he wasn't really there. So he really, he really had the chance to be, you know, eyes eyeballing the battlefield and seeing the battle as it unfolds. In fact, one chapter, he's hearing artillery in the distance, but where is he? Well, he's sipping tea in a Chinese garden. So, you know, my question is like, you can send all these observers there, but were they really a good observer? Did they actually really be there on the ground and see the, the battle as it unfolds? They're safely detached. There's, I would argue that it's a similar thing. Think, think of when you play a video game of World War Two. I think there's the, the latest one was uh, Modern Warfare, I think, which, was, which places you in World War Two you're experiencing battle but you're there's there's no risk there there's a sterility to it or it's very it's a very sterile experience because you're detached you're safe you're not actually in danger you can play out the strategy and there's no real risk to you i could see how you'd then learn or take away the wrong lessons of oh this side won from this strategy that strategy must be good but you lose the you've lost that the actual loss of human life the human toll of those strategies because you've become detached because you aren't actually there on the ground with the troops yeah i i guess that's sort of like that fog of war from a general's perspective you, mm. you're not seeing it as it unfolds yeah and but the thing is like you know you you spend a lot of money on these guys to send them overseas and to you know be embedded in the battlefield with the with the japanese or the russians to get some valuable lessons but if you're not actually there and it's such a waste of money it's such a waste of resources you just you know you aimed your you know telescope at the wrong area <laughs> pretty much all right so what did the other experts uh, so you had the you know, french german american the british as well so what did they learn from the russian japanese war? so we talked about artillery we talked about you know gone are the days of pretty much artillery duels And they're now, you know, learning to entrench themselves, learning to conceal themselves in the rear slope. And they're learning about coordinating the fires. And I guess 
Why is that? Because artillery is sort of that the smart part of the arms corps, which they have to do all these mathematics and they're developing new technologies with the development of cannons and um, artillery pieces that they need to be a bit more, I guess, switched on in, in trying to adapt their tactics. Well, what did the cavalry learn this time? Well, the Japanese war, uh, well, there wasn't much cavalry action. So he said, you know what? It's not really applicable to us because, you know, those hills in Manchuria, well, they're not a European battlefield. In the European battlefield, we have mass open areas, so it's not applicable for us. So we're still going to, the lessons we learned from from Russian Japanese war, it's not applicable to us. Well, they're going to learn a really hard lesson fast forward 10 years when they start charging horses into machine guns. And that's when we, we, we talk about cavalry tactics needs to be now sort of armored fighting vehicles. That kind of, there needs to be some kind of fast vehicle with well armored to protect themselves from machine guns and or something to cross that barrier to start looking at the tank. What did the infantry learn? Well, the infantry experts, they what they took away was, well, these Japanese soldiers, they have this really strong patriotism. And this is what uh, Sir Ian Hamilton's, uh, he wrote in his opening chapters, that this admiration of these old civilizations over these new democracies. So Japan, the Nepalese, the Gurkhas, the Boas, they're able to endure the harsh climate compared to the the, you know, to the new gen to the new democracies like the Brits, where they had soldiers who were gentlemanly and urban. So the old kind of you know warrior kind of spirit is gonna help us overcome the difficulties in a battle. And again, that's the romanticizing of war, which was something that at that point in history, everything from the common soldiery all the way up to the the generals and the commanders, everyone still had this romantic idea of what warfare was and mm. that these were the rules that you played by and followed but obviously yeah. when the desire to inflict as much damage to the enemy as possible and at, at the fastest rate when that became the order of the day that romantic ideal was decimated yeah yeah and <laughs> It's going to be a big shock for them 10 years later on. It's like, yeah. well, I thought I learned from the Russian-Japanese war. Well, apparently you didn't. Well, it's, it's, the same, it's the same thing we were talking before about the lines of, of musketmen lining up and conducting strategy or the story I told before of, the light, of the, the light horse charge and getting cut down by machine guns. The commanders are going, we followed the right tactics. We, we did everything from the rule book that we were supposed to do. This was how it's supposed to work. It didn't work. What's going on? Let's try it again. <laughs> we, we didn't use enough men this time. Oh, gosh. Wrong lesson, mates. Wrong lesson. Oh, no. Yeah, so there's a lack. Some some of the guys who've done actual research on this, uh, on the, some of the observations from the Russian-Japanese war, they said, well, how come there's a lack of talk about machine guns or they you know, they either dismiss the machine gun or underestimate it? Um, they still see that martial spirit, you know, that, the guy with a rifle and a bayonet. And, you know, they said, well, a lot of enemy were killed with the bayonet with knife wounds, but that was only because by the time you've crossed the trench, by the time you've faced a machine gun, the artillery, you're worn out. And then so you across, what, 500 meters on the open, you are tired. And then that Russian guy sitting in the trench can just walk six meters and just bay bayonet you in the gut. So probably the wrong stats and probably the wrong takeaway points another thing that was uh not talked about was communications and intelligence so the use of telephone wires to provide you know live updates and quick updates about what's happening direct direct artillery fire uh the use of intelligence by especially by the japanese especially because they've embedded all their spies and they've they're uh they pretty much know much of the the battle plan of the russians so why is this i guess there was that talk about people wanting to support their own core or institution. So the cavalry didn't want to do it with the horses because I guess they were the higher class of the, the military because owning a horse was expensive and that sort of meant that you're that upper class part of the military and they didn't want to see their 
institution being taken down. Uh, there's probably racism with the European powers looking at the Japanese as well as the Russians as well because there was that sort of prejudice against as Russians saying, ah, oh, they're not really perform well, they're Russian, not actually taking away the lessons of the powder machine gun. And what they take away, martial spirit, the power of the offensive to defeat the prepared positions. It confirmed the tactics and training, especially because it was the German uh, tactics and the training manuals that the Japanese were using. And so overall, you know what, Japanese won, so therefore it confirms that our methods work. Not knowing and not digging depth onto the cost of the Japanese during each of those assaults. Yeah, so to still believe that the, if we just do a frontal assault, we can win. Not really taking away the lesson that, well, the Japanese actually switched tactics doing siege warfare. And uh, we talked earlier about the videos. Um, I've got a photo from the French uniforms from 1914 to 1918. So can you see the similarities to some of the videos that you saw from the Rus Russian-Japanese war? Yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah, yeah. I'll describe, <laughs> yeah, describe it for the listeners. Like 1914, what does, a Russian, what does this French uh, uniform look like? Well, it's bright, well, so it's what, uh, navy blue uniform? Yep. And then peak hat. Uh, and it's all cloth or woolen. You have bright red sort of stripes on the arms and the collar and really bright red pants there. Almost comically so. Oh, gosh. And over time, you're seeing the do away the red because red just make you a big target. And you're starting to see introduction of the steel hel helmets and, st and introduction of automatic weapons. Yeah. And that sort of like dusty khaki kind of uh uniform there mm. well also no, so it's, it took them two years into the conflict to realize oh maybe we shouldn't be giving our soldiers cot wool or felt caps maybe we need to give them some helmets so 1916 they introduced some form of protective headgear yeah. um yeah also also the gu note the guns change well in 1917 they introduced gas masks as a part yeah. of the the kit and yeah. Also, also the guns are changing as well. So, nineteen fourteen and fifteen, they they've still got the musket. Also, the what was the, bay the bayonet. That's the word I'm yeah. looking for. Look at that bayonet. That's like a forearm length. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Like that. It's a yeah. it's a big it's a big piece of hardware. But yeah. by the uh, and it's a bit cut off in the nineteen sixteen photo. But as they as the years progress, the gun becomes more utilitarian almost in it in its yeah. aesthetic. I'm not sure why that. As uh, in in the design world, we we learn the idea of a form follows function, which essentially yeah. su suggests the idea that you you need to make sure it works first, and then you worry about what it looks like. Mm. But at the start of World War Two, I can tell that the entire design the entire design of the uniform is function follows form. The form of it is important; it needs to look a certain way, as opposed mm -hmm. to it needs to work a certain way. And by the end of the conflict that entire design philosophy has been turned on its head where now it needs to work, it needs to perform a job, and then we worry about the look. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe it's like one of that martial spirit kind of idea that you have these bright uniforms, so therefore your spirits in your morale is going to be increased. Yeah. Not knowing that maybe that's probably make you a big target for the enemy. Mm. Anyway. I think it would make you a, make you a giant target. F fun fact, actually, the hu the human eye is able to see the color red more easily because yeah. of the we have our more red cones in our in our actual eye, so we can yeah. see the color that much easier. Well, I thought that maybe like the Brits they had like the red uniform during the Zulu War, and is it because it to uh, was it to camouflage the blood or something or to hide the blood so it doesn't decrease the morale of the of their own soldiers that's a fair point to be totally honest yeah the english or the british soldiers were known as the term redcoats <laughs> because yeah. their entire uniform was just red blob mm. yeah well it did transition to khaki kind of uniform mm. before world war one I. I think after the boer Bo war yeah and, yeah and you see like i guess that video where the russian japanese war where the, the bright uniforms were eventually dirtied because they been in the trench so long, they've been lying in the gut so long trying to duck the machine gun. Yeah. That the sort of evolution occurred. All right. So the tragedy at Gallipoli and drawing this back to Gallipoli is that there's a lack of development of weaponry during that, between that war period of 1905 to 1914. 
the British stock of bombs were actually almost uh, reduced around that period. And what happened in Gallipoli? Well, they had to improvise. The, you can see there's a there's a photo of the jam tin grenade, which is what Nestle milks can, and also maybe uh, there's like a bully beef kind of can, and they just put full of explosives and ball bearings, and they just lob it at the enemy to clear out these trenches. So it's something that the Japanese had to learn during the Russian Japanese War. And what, what was the other thing? Trench mortars. So there was no development of mortars by the Brits, and so at Gallipoli they had to make a garland mortar. So improvised, similar to what Sir Ian Hamilton learned at uh, Russian Japanese War with the Japanese making like these bamboo tube. You can't adjust them, they only shoot at 45 degrees, and what do they shoot? They shoot jam tin grenades. So, yeah, the British expeditionary forces in France in 1914 had to improvise again and make grenades and these wooden mortars. Uh, we didn't see any development of light machine guns uh, since the Russian Japanese War. They're still using these wheeled Maxim or Vickers machine guns, and we didn't really see Bren guns or submachine guns until after war. So by the time you see, you know, submachine guns, it's already pretty much too late. The war was already going to an end. And so this is what um, this is what Sir Ian Hamilton wrote from General Sir Ian Hamilton to War Office. Your number 5272A2. I particularly request that you may reconsider your proposal not to order more Japanese bombs. These bombs are most effective and in high favour with our troops, whose locally made weapons, on which they have to frequently rely, are far inferior to the bombs used by the Turks. Our great difficulty in holding captured trenches is that the Turks always counterattack with a large number of these powerful bombs. Apparently the supply of these is limitless, unless the delay in arrival is likely to extend over several months. Therefore I would suggest that a large order be sent to Japan. We cannot have too many of these weapons, and it should not cancel my number MFQT1321, which should be treated as additional. So Sir Ian Hamilton's at Gallipoli saying we need to get more grenades, we need to get these mortars, we need to have these bombs. I'm sorry, but like 10 years. And that's probably the painful bit of it. It's like you had this time and now you're at Gallipoli, it's a bit too late. You, you can't, you know, starting a supply and starting a logist logistic chain in the battle and hurrying in it <laughs> because it's immediate is very difficult compared to doing peacetime. Yeah, so there was this lack of innovative offensive tactics at Gallipoli. The Turks had learned had applied these lessons from the Russian-Japanese war because they had uh, German uh, advisors, they had these forts, they had these trenches and these machine guns. And unfortunately, there was still this obsession with the bayonet and human wave tactics. So we didn't learn the lessons from this Russian-Japanese war tragedy, which had 100,000 to 206,000 casualties. And what did the Gallipoli lead? It had 552 casualties on both sides. And this is a key part of the the Anzac story. It's that the terrain also played a critical factor. Where even if we, tr even if the British soldiers tr or the British generals tried to execute the implement the same strategy, the terrain of Gallipoli was nowhere near suited to essentially its vertical rock face that you need yeah. to climb up. They, if, yeah, yeah. The, and again, the, the argument could be also made that they were intending to plant their soldiers somewhere else. I think it was, the further, it was further up the coast. But irregardless, if you land on the terrain and you then go, well, we're going to execute the same strategy, because the strategy, we saw it work um, several years ago. We, we can use it again here. The terrain was against you. Every single factor of, engage, of engaging in conflict was not in your favor. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, these cavalry guys, oh, it's not applicable to us because we fight the European uh, continent. It's like, well, you still got to adapt and learn <laughs> because well, you can't do really do mounted horse attacks against trench, entrenched Turkish uh, soldiers in Gallipoli. You got to adapt your tactics there too. You still got to evolve. But yeah, like the tragedy is that we've, we could have learned so much back in 1904 to 1905 and we didn't learn the right lesson. Yeah. And, and it's so easy to forget and to just be lax in that 10-year 
period. And then when war comes in 1914, you know, same frontal attacks, which lead to mass casualties. And that's the tragedy of it. Like, we knew about this in 1904, 1905. And so this is what one, the Russian from, um, from Port Arthur wrote. So he goes, I'm absolutely convinced that in a future campaign, we have double line in Manchuria, when Vladivostok has been strongly fortified, we have twice the number of guns besides Maxims to every company, we shall utterly defeat them and drive them off the continent. So this is what, what he says when he says, if we could do the Russian-Japanese war again, and arm ourselves and double the trenches, double machine guns, we can defeat the Japanese. And, and here's an interesting thing. So, you know, what's the human uh, failure here is that we didn't really learn the right lessons or you say, oh, the Japanese won, so therefore we should follow their tactics. Well, here's a letter which I'll read out because I think we must be careful about following in anything like servile fashion, the Japanese, merely because the Japanese have won. Doubtless, you remember how after the Franco-German War, it became the fashion to copy all the bad points as well as the good points of the German army organizations, so that in our own army, they actually introduced this preposterous spiked helmets for the army. As foolish as a kind of headgear for modern warfare as could be invented, we should be on the lookout now not to commit a similar kind of fault as regards the Japanese. Not all the things they have done have been wise, and some of the wise things they have done are not wise for us. So that was from President Theodore Roosevelt to the Chief of Staff, Adner R. Chaffee, on the 3rd of July, 1905. Yeah, the Germans won the French, the French German War, so therefore we can copy everything. So we're going to introduce these spiked helmets into our American army because the Germans won. All right, so the application here. I think when you learn from history, you need to de delve deep into these questions about what could have been done better, what didn't I see, what did the facts and the statistics tell me, what was unimportant, what was irrelevant, and what are my biases. So all those points that the, the observers at Russian-Japanese war overlooked. So you gotta be aware of your own biases. Uh, just don't just copy everything from the winning side. Don't dismiss anything. And you know, if you if you could be on the opposite side and learn from them, even though they lost, what did it what are some of the things that they did well? So what are the things that the Russians did well? Well, they had these forts, they had machine guns, they did, they held back Japanese three times the size. And so, you know what, that's a good point you can learn. Um, what's, but what's that challenge? I think the, the challenge is that history is hard. Well, history, it can be hard to learn the lessons from history, and it can be dull just going through massive amounts of books. So, you know, a psychologist I was talking to told me that you, you can't just, you know, give a, a book to someone for professional learning if they're, you know, they're busy and they're not really motivated because, you know, reading reading is hard. It can be pretty boring to go through these old books and trying to tease out these small gems because sort of reading about Sir Ian Hamilton's time sipping tea in the, in the, in the garden it's like well what are you talking about <laughs> yeah and, and so these lessons that we learn need to be fed into our organizations to our businesses our family our church and they need to be taught well you know what it's a human thing we forget we don't really learn much you know coronavirus we talked about it earlier in the beginning of this podcast before going in you know, we talk about swine flu, we talk about Ebola, we talk about SARS. These all happened before coronavirus, so you could have easily learned something before then and to learn how to build up your uh, stockpile, or build up your, build, uh, develop, you know, good procedures and processes before going just into a blanket shutdown. Uh, natural disasters, you know, bushfires and floods, we get told, you know, always try to have a plan ready for that so that when the worst case occurs, you won't end up being swept away. Uh, and so failure to learn from lessons from history means, you know what, you're going to have to relearn this in blood. And so why not just use someone else's blood from history to build yourself up, to build your business, to build your family, to build your church up. And you need to write these th things down. Uh, you need to write your plans down and keep them up to date. Otherwise, you know, your plans just pretty much useless there. Anyway, 
Pat, what's your takeaway? Probably one takeaway I've got here is that learning from history is critically important because time and again, as we've seen this, uh, from this evening's conversation, when you don't learn from the mistakes, mistakes of history, we are doomed to repeat it on an endless cycle. And learning these sort of lessons can help to prepare us for things in the future. I guess one interesting takeaway here is not being totally reliant on head knowledge alone. We can see from the story of Hamilton that he he looked at the essentially his external observation. He took an outsider's look in and looked at essentially of the history of this conflict. And then, well, I'm going to take that idea and transplant it directly into my conflict. Uh, I'd say much can be learned probably from first-hand experience. I think that if he were on the ground with the soldiers on those front lines, he would have seen how absolutely devastating what the, the impact of what those decisions were make on the lives of individuals, and that probably would have drastically altered his perception. Taking that first-hand experience would greatly inform the, your decision-making and your opinions of important decisions that you have to make, not necessarily on a military stage, but in your own personal lives. Yeah, it, it's, it's sometimes sad to see sometimes businesses would do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. You, may, you have a new boss, and he's like, let's say this, and it's like, well, no, we actually done that. You know, from our previous boss, and we we don't want to do that. Uh, we've we've seen the failures of that. So they say, oh no no no, I I know how to do it better, and they end up doing the same thing over again. It's it's a human thing, I think, and that's the battle we need to fight. We've come to an end of episode nine. How we failed to learn from the past, lessons from the Russian-Japanese War, and World War I. We've listed some of the contributing factors that led to a failure to learn from the Russian-Japanese War and for the world powers to repeat the same mistakes in the early years of World War I. While we are reminded every year to observe the end of the Great War and the human lives lost, perhaps what made these tragedies hit us at a deeper level was the knowledge that we were repeating the same lessons taught in blood by Japanese and Russian soldiers 10 years ago. History may not rigidly repeat itself, but there's a rhythm to it. I think it's also a very human thing that we always forget the past and make the same mistakes, and thus it should motivate us to learn from the experiences of those who have gone before us so that we may benefit from the lessons and the mistakes. If you like this episode, please like and subscribe and give us five stars. Put a link on your social media page to share with your friends. Every bit of support counts and it motivates me to put out more episodes. You can reach us at thefireinthedesert at gmail.com or Twitter at fireinthedesert. Music is On the Hills of Manchuria, 1909 instrumental version performed by the 1st Grenadier Artillery Brigade's orchestra which has entered into the public domain of the Russian Federation. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you guys next time.